Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's Your Active event on a sustainable future. What is the potential for the EU's bioeconomy? My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based here in Brussels. I'm coming at you live from the Euractive studios in the heart of the EU quarter. Welcome to everyone watching online and also to everyone here in the room. So today's discussion is on the bioeconomy. So first and foremost, let's talk about what the bioeconomy is. So the bioeconomy is made up of various businesses that convert renewable resources from agriculture, forests, and seas, and that includes residues and waste, into food, feed, materials, and energy. According to the European Commission, a sustainable bioeconomy is necessary to build a carbon-neutral future in line with the climate objectives set in the Paris Agreement. Bioenergy is actually currently the EU's largest renewable energy source and remains a key component of the energy mix in 2023 currently. Now, the 2018 update of the Commission's bioeconomy strategy aims to accelerate the deployment of sustainable European bioeconomy to maximize its contribution towards the 2030 agenda and its sustainable development goals, as well as the Paris Agreement. But over the past two decades, the bioeconomy has been subject to policy fluctuations, which some say have inhibited the growth and prevented it from reaching its full potential. Others, on the other hand, have concerns about the unintended consequences of the use of some of these resources, and there's been particular heated debate about the use of materials from the forestry sector, as well as the use of biofuels for transport. So in today's panel, we're going to discuss where we're at in terms of the bioeconomy's place in the EU's energy mix and its future in the EU's decarbonization plans. We'll also discuss the new policy manifesto adopted for the sector and assess the success of the EU's updated bioeconomy strategy. To talk about these issues, we have a great group of panelists here, all very knowledgeable in this field. Let me introduce you to them now. We have Peter Verheim, who is Head of Unit for Bioeconomy and Food Systems at the European Commission's Research and Innovation Department. We have Christina Nordeus, Councillor for Agriculture for the Permanent Representation of Sweden to the European Union. We have Simona Vrek, Councillor for Agriculture for the Permanent Representation of Slovenia to the EU. We have Barna Kovacs, Director General for BioEast, which is an initiative for the bioeconomy in Eastern Europe. We have Justus Wesseler joining us online. Justus is a researcher at Wageningen University. And we have Juliette Jacques, Deputy Managing Director for the Industry Association Starch Europe. Thank you all so much for joining us here today for this discussion. <laughs> Peter, let me start with a question for you. So I talked about some of the, the EU initiatives there and also the EU strategy in this area. How, from the Commission's perspective, would you say that the EU, that EU policy can help meet the full potential of the bioeconomy in Europe while also safeguarding against any potential negative effects? Good afternoon. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you, for, um, Dave, for introducing and uh, organizing this uh, event on uh, the bioeconomy um, um, policy. Uh, um, I think that's uh, um, excellent uh, and, and a very good uh, time to, to talk about um, the potential of the EU bioeconomy uh, to cont contribute to the uh, sustainable future. Uh, in my view, uh, the bioeconomy already um, today is the driver for uh, sustainable uh, solutions and has uh, great potential um, to do uh, more. But let's step back for a moment um, and uh, um, also um, mention that we do uh, indeed uh, face uh, huge uh, challenges. Uh, um, one of them is uh, uh, currently discussed uh, um, at COP28, uh, the climate crisis. We have a poly crisis also with geopolitical uh, um, issues, uh, social climate, cl um, climate change, and biodiversity uh, um, challenges. Um, and uh, um, overall, um, I think uh, we, we have um, an ever better understanding that we need to reduce um, um, also the collective uh, uh, footprint um, of human activities uh, 
um, on our planet. Uh, we have no planet B. Um, and uh, um, from our point of view, the EU um, policy framework uh, for the bioeconomy uh, provides an opportunity uh, to combine in a holistic way uh, sustainable production and consumption um, decoupled from natural resource um, depletion, um, competitiveness while reducing the dependence on, on fossil uh, materials. Um, it's really this coherent and a bio-based approach uh, that um, from our point of view is a backbone of our circular sustainable uh, bioeconomy uh, strategy which allows to address conflicts and trade-offs within EU uh, policies but also between um, EU and national uh, implementation and can help us uh, to identify uh, ways forward. We see the EU as a uh, bioeconomy policy as an enabling uh, uh, framework. It's not a top-down approach uh, but it uh, um, um, supports um, um, member states but also regions in identifying strengths and weaknesses uh, um, related uh, to the bioeconomy and to deal with the trade-offs that exist and identify a uh, really uh, viable um, solution that address all three dimensions of sustainability. Um, and uh, um, the Council um, has um, also adopted uh, Council conclusions uh, on this uh, um, and to give us uh, um, the job to, to work on an update of the EU bioeconomy um, strategy um, by the end of this uh, um, strategic uh, uh, period. And um, I think this is uh, another opportunity uh, to, to work with member states uh, um, and stakeholders uh, together in um, yeah, um, um, further building coherence uh, and uh, mainstream the bioeconomy into um, existing EU instruments and uh, um, therefore uh, reap um, um, the, uh, uh, the potential better while also um, ensuring that there are um, good, good safeguards uh, for, the, for the environment and other aspects. Thanks, Peter. Now, I forgot to mention at the start, if you have questions for Peter or for any of the panelists, uh, you're going to be able to ask them. The way we do it here is both if you're watching online or if you're in here, you can ask them via Slido. So you can scan that QR code uh, if you're here in the room. You can start typing in your questions now, and I will put your questions to the panelists at the end of the panel. Now, Christina, um, Peter was mentioning the ongoing, some of the ongoing work in the council on this. Uh, so each EU member state will have their national policy on the bioeconomy, and then, of course, there's the uh, policy agreed at European level. Um, tell me, what's been the national policy of Sweden when it comes to the bioeconomy? Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, so uh, I wanted to start by mentioning that Sweden is a, a really big country and it, it's, the land area is almost 70% forest uh, and less than 10% agricultural land. And of course, this has sort of shaped um, our policies going back a really long time in Sweden. And, and giving our vast size, we also have a lot of rural areas. And to our view, the bioeconomy is really very important to keep uh, vibrant rural uh, areas in the country. So this is sort of uh, the, the, the background uh, to, to our work on bioeconomy. And we also see that the, the bioeconomy has a great potential uh, when it comes to meeting this sort of multitude of challenges that we are facing currently. So it can uh, contribute by increasing competitiveness, increasing resilience, and of course, uh, help in the green transition. And as I mentioned, it's very important for rural areas because it, it helps uh, valorizing biomass and, and uh, resi residual products, but it also creates jobs in, in, in the rural areas. So for us, this has been something we've been working with for a really long time. And, and I have something I wanted to mention, which I think is really interesting. And that's in, in 1991 already, we um, uh, introduced a national uh, carbon dioxide tax on fossil fuel emissions. And this sort of uh, led to a shift where we have increased the, the use of um, bioenergy and, and biofuels. And it has uh, helped in reducing Swedish emissions uh, drastically while uh, keeping the growth at, at uh, normal levels. 
so this is a sort of this was perhaps the sort of starting point of the working with the uh, circular um, bio-based economy. But then we also have the forestry. I mentioned it's a very important sector to us. And and there we I think we we have been working with how to use, use uh, by forest biomass for a long time both for the energy transition, but also uh, more lately, perhaps we've been uh, developing um, sort of innovative products that can be used in, in various fields. <laughs> and I think a, a key for being able to, to be at the forefront uh, when it comes to, to forestry by uh, economy is that we, of course, we have this uh, vast biomass uh, production ongoing all the time, of course, in, the, in our forests. But we also have, um, have had really good forestry policies that both are there to, um, that of course are there to protect our forests and make sure that they, they will remain for, for coming generations. But at the same time, uh, they don't hinder sort of using the bio, biomass that, that is produced there. Uh, and also, uh, we have a, had a forestry inventory for uh, 100 years, which is also important to keep track of what's happening in the forests. And then what I finally wanted to mention is that we have an innovation-friendly uh, business climate in Sweden, which uh, also helps uh, our companies to sort of be at the front, forefront when it comes to bioeconomy and Finally, because now I'm saying a lot of final things, but <laughs> I also wanted to mention because the the bioeconomy is a sort of um, it it involves all levels of the of the society, so from local to regional to national and of course EU level, and I think this is really important. And we have a strong involvement of the regions uh, in Sweden, but we also actually uh, I think we're among the first to start collecting regional statistics on bioeconomy. And I think this is also a, a key feature to be able to, to see what is happening and, and where we are going. Great. So, Simona, Slovenia is a country with much less land area than Sweden, but also uh, has an interesting resource situation. Um, so, tell me, what is the policy of Slovenia when it comes to the bioeconomy? Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, and also, thank you for having us here. Um, I think uh, very shortly said, Slovenia, in terms of bioeconomy, would like once be there where Sweden already is. We are um, as well aware of the potentials of bioeconomy and um, what we can say, we have the potential, but this potential uh, in Slovenia has not yet been used to the extent uh, that we would like to see. And with this in mind, we have... Uh, uh, kind of uh, also use the EU framework in order to um, um, improve, uh, uh, improve and uh, further develop the bioeconomy sector. And we also joined the Bio East initiative. It's an initiative of Eastern European countries, uh, which are maybe faced with some um, similar starting points. So we are a little bit lagging behind. Um, we have also specific limitations. Uh, the countries are not the same in the Bio, Bio East initiative. But for example, for Slovenia, also with a lot of forests to mention, not to be uh, 60, almost 60% of forest, um, um, we have limitations in terms of size, structural problems. So the forest owners, they're very small, and also the farmers. Um, and um, if we talk about bioeconomy, what we mostly have uh, developed is the conventional bioeconomy, where you have from primary produce, you produce food, processed food, but also processed wood for a pulp and paper and uh, wood industry. So it's kind of a different, maybe a starting point. And um, what we are also seeing, uh, what is um, where we are lagging behind is that we are uh, in the structures, in the industry, we don't have the necessary co uh, connections. We are lacking the cooperations between uh, the, um, the companies um, uh, active in this sector. Um, this does not mean that we don't have uh, new, vibrant uh, developments uh, and startups, but, but due to this uh, size and structural limitations, uh, they are mostly active uh, on a SME scale. Uh, we also don't have a bio-raffinery -raff yet, uh, and this is also um, one of the reasons why we are seeking um, to participate in a, uh, or to cooperate in a macro-regional context. Even today, um, what uh, 
we would like to change is that we produce a lot of wood, round wood, but we export this wood because we don't have own uh, sawmill capacities. And um, with uh, further uh, adding value in the process, uh, along the value chains, we could, we could reap the benefits of a bioeconomy. We could add value, we could create new qualitative jobs. Rural development, as in Sweden, is also in Slovenia, very important. And um, it's a potential to further strengthen the position of the rural areas. Um, maybe one, um, one interesting thing is, despite that we know about this potential, Slovenia has not yet um, taken the step to establish a known strategy on bioeconomy. Um, but on the other side, uh, we cannot say that we have totally forgotten, and not absolutely. It's included in other strategies. And uh, you could imagine that for a small country with limited resources, it's sometimes difficult for ha to have for every um, horizontal or every horizontal topic, uh, cross-sector policy, an own strategy. So the, the, um, the, 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 the topics related to bio, uh, bioeconomy are included in the smart specialization strategy, where in, in particular the wood and the wood uh, value chain is. Um, uh, uh, recognized as one of the big potentials we have. But also in the new um, industrial, Slovenian industrial policy towards 2030, um, there uh, everything uh, what, which is related to circular economy, to transition to, uh, to green transition, um, r um, increasing efficiency, um, energy efficiency, and uh, increasing um, renewable energy use uh, is covered. Um, as well in the National uh, Energy and uh, Climate Plan, which we will have now to upgrade um, with a look uh, to achieve the new targets. Uh, there also bioeconomy is covered, um, but maybe what we are lacking is a good coordination between uh, those uh, different strategies. And also at the ministerial level, we still don't have one a responsible ministry for bioeconomy. It's a little bit scattered between the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry uh, for Cohesion or Cohesion Policy, Spatial Planning and Environment Ministry. So these are all uh, areas where we have to, where we can do something from a policy, policy perspective, but we also hope that uh, with further um, development of, of demand for bio-based project, that this will be uh, an important pool uh, for the industry, for the companies to better engage as well. And uh, maybe finally, it's very important to have um, also um, a good connection between the research and development and the companies. And here we can show some, uh, some uh, opportunities, some good starting points, and we have just further to deepen it. It's interesting what you say about uh, having a dedicated bioeconomy minister. Maybe we can come back to this point because it is in a lot of ways very cross-sectoral and there's a question of how can we make it a little bit more cohesive, right? Um, so Barna, uh, Simona mentioned the BioEase project. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and also how science policy interlinkages can boost the bioeconomy through fostering partnerships that might not otherwise happen. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, basically, after Simona, it's, uh, everything was said for me. So it's, uh, I have an easy way just to generalize what I am saying this. I am uh, representing here the Biased Initiative. It stands, it's a governmental level initiative. It's not a project, it's an initiative. And standing for 11 countries, the three Baltic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the four Visegrad, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, then the southeastern European countries, uh, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Romania, and Bulgaria at governmental level. And uh, continuing what uh, was uh, said uh, before, why we need this uh, biased initiative? Because we realize that we are lagging behind in research and innovation, lagging behind the research and innovation of, um, of, um, in agriculture, forestry. But then it was suddenly it was easy and immediate realization that we are not just lagging behind in agriculture and forestry or in water or on fisheries. But we are lagging behind in bioeconomy, in the systemic thinking. So what, why we created the, the Biased Initiative, it was to better perform at the uh, high level, excellent based uh, European research arena. Uh, so to say, the European Research Framework Program. We have to admit 
that the bioeconomy is still research and innovation uh, driven uh, um, a policy, very much research and innovation um, driven policy. If we admit this and then we put together with the number which I was not using in the past uh, three, four years, but I have to use it here again uh, for the sake of this discussion, the all together the 11 countries benefit less than 7% from the European research framework program, which is meant for bioeconomy. In the past 10 years, it was spent more than 10 billion euro for bioeconomy research. And uh, altogether, we, we, we received less than 7% or we benefited less than 7% uh, from that pr uh, program. So it, was, it is obvious if it's research driven, if it's innovation driven, this uh, policy, we need to better participate in that. And then uh, we also realized that if we want to participate better, we need also strategic thinking. So the BIAST initiative, on one hand, it's helping to develop strategic research and innovation agenda from the macro region point of view to influence the future EU policy. But also we are helping the member states to develop their own strategy, strategic thinking, action plans in bioeconomy. You might say, oh, then everything is on a track and we are on. But it was obvious, yes, we are not. We are not yet. We are, the BIOIST is the first messenger in the countries who are trying to pledge that it's, we are talking about an interconnected sector by economy. It's a, um, between the different sectors, it's a horizontal issue. We need to have interministerial discussions between different ministries. And now coming back to your question, science policy, why we need science policy discussions. And uh, let me bring uh, up here three issues. If uh, we t consider the Green Deal and the Green Deal strategies and the Green Deal legislation, none of them, or almost most of them, I would say, I, if I would be by definition, I would say even all of them need biomass to realize the targets which were set in those strategies. Almost all of them. I'm saying almost to be a more research uh, fellow, but we need biomass to reach the targets to be by two, uh, 2050 uh, climate neutral. But when you are looking into those uh, policies and legislations, it's not very much reflected. It's not in a core front that we need biomass by economy. Secondly, if uh, we are discussing about um, sustainability, we have to see that by economy is not sustainable by definition. So if we want to make it sustainable, we have to have a systemic approach between the different sectors. And then uh, if we have that sustainability and we wish to be sustainable, those sectors need to discuss uh, among uh, themselves. So altogether, if we put this together, we see that we need to have uh, evidence base to prove for the countries that uh, we, um, we are working together. We need to work on a systemic approach. We need uh, evidence for policies. And let me also add, it's apparently visible that the countries, due to the lot of legislation, lot of um, uh, upcoming um, uh, strategies, they are tired. They have, they, uh, the public administration, as it was clearly said, it's not that um, we don't want to do, especially in Eastern Europe. There are no capacities. It's very difficult to cope with all those new legislations. And in that context, we need to combine our forces. We need to bring in into discussion, uh, so to say, a science policy discussion which help these countries, not necessarily just one country, but even more countries together. And, uh, and uh, those countries need evidences behind and they need to be helped in this platform. So I clearly pledge, and I think it's very very important to build up those science policy discussion forums and that's why we in the biased initiative we put in place seven thematic working groups where the ministry people are discussing with experts and seven in seven thematic areas and that's I think uh, the the way out from that to help the countries who are by alone cannot solve issues but we can help together and uh, help them in the in the future let me just add and one more uh, sentence for the future what is not also clear for the Eastern European countries and also in the ministries, that they usually are not set to work with the stakeholders. Uh, it's very difficult to engage the stakeholders, especially in those countries where there is no bioeconomy strategy, and in most of the Eastern European countries there are no bioeconomy strategy, then a ministry in, it, in its remit cannot involve the stakeholders, all the bioeconomy stakeholders. So where we can help with the bias initiative that we, in the coming two, three years, we try to gather the stakeholders and the stakeholder engagement, it will be a priority for us to show for the policymakers what are the needs from the, uh, from the stakeholders. So I stop here talking also about the future. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Barna. So next, let's turn to Justice, who's joining us remotely. So, Justice, you have been researching these issues. What's been, what has your research indicated about the place of the bioeconomy in uh, the green transition and in uh, European policy? Yes, uh, thank you, Dave, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I also like to join the others in congratulating Eurective for organizing this event, which is very important. So greetings here uh, from Wageningen. Um, we have um, organized and shared a large European Union project called uh, Biomonitor. And we looked into the importance of uh, the contribution of the bioeconomy uh, to uh, development within the European Union, taking into consideration all the challenges that we are facing. Um, when we look at the results, what we first uh, observe that many countries, and this has been mentioned before, already have a bioeconomy strategy and more countries than uh, when we started the project uh, four years ago. What is further important to acknowledge is that there's not only one bioeconomy. Uh, the, the countries all look uh, different with respect to the importance and uh, the uh, specific emphasis they put on uh, development. Still, uh, for assessing the contribution of the bioeconomy, we have to come up uh, with a definition that is operational. And what economists uh, do in this case is um, they try to define using uh, national accounting systems what are sectors and subsectors that can be considered being part of the bioeconomy. And what is important in, in this context is that we not only have to look at the major sectors like agriculture, food processing, uh, pulp and paper sectors, but also that uh, the bioeconomy plays an important role in the upstream and downstream sectors. Well, well, what does this imply? So in the downstream sectors, the bioeconomy is, for example, contributing to uh, the chemical industry. In the upstream sector, the bioeconomy requires inputs, uh, let's say, from the seed sector and other sectors. And this is important to consider, as we have figured out when we use uh, the uh, uh, national accounting statistics, that the contribution of the the up and downstream sectors is twice and often more than twice as large as the core sectors of the bioeconomy. And that is an important also for uh, policy to consider that if we have a, a policy that is addressing the agriculture uh, or the food sector, that this has spillover, positive spillovers on the other sectors uh, as well. And we can use these data then, for example, for assessing how policies, if we have time series data available, have an impact on the performance of the EU bioeconomy. Uh, and we have developed what we call a dashboard together with the Joint Research uh, Center of the European Union, and you can easily find this by just uh, uh, putting into your Google account biomonitor.eu and there you can find uh, further um, information. Now, what is further important uh, when we look into the uh, future, when we try to model uh, what the bioeconomy in the future may uh, contribute, that in particular the regulatory environment that the different um, uh, actors that are part of the bioeconomy are facing is extremely important. And Vana Kovac has mentioned this uh, in his uh, contribution that um, it's not so trivial uh, to uh, invest within the bioeconomy considering uh, the policy environment uh, that companies are facing in the European Union. This requires further action from policy makers to simplify uh, for the private sector to uh, stimulate uh, um, incentives to invest in the bioeconomy. Now, this is uh, for the European Union. What is also important to observe and what we figured out is that what the European Union did had uh, substantial positive implications also for other regions of the world, for Africa, uh, for Latin America, and even uh, for the uh, United States. Now, with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, they also uh, put the bioeconomy very highly on the agenda. And the interesting thing is uh, that for measuring and monitoring um, the uh, 
development in the US bioeconomy, they adapted the methodologies that have been developed uh, in Europe. So this is a nice uh, positive contribution uh, across uh, uh, the Atlantic. Now with this, uh, I'd like to finish my contribution. Happy to take further questions uh, and comments into account. I'd just like to make two further remarks. Uh, there is a special issue coming up with Euro choices, where we summarize all the different results from the Bio uh, Monitor project. And uh, next year, there is a meeting of the International Consortium on Applied Bioeconomy Research in, in Italy, where further uh, results of the status of the bioeconomy are discussed and invite everyone to participate and join. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Justice. So let's turn to Juliet next. So Juliet, you're a member of the European Bioeconomy Alliance. So from the perspective of the Alliance, how are you approaching the potential of the bioeconomy? Thank you for clarifying that I'm actually here on behalf of uh, the European Bioeconomy Alliance. I'll just take uh, 30 seconds to introduce you to the European Bioeconomy Alliance and to say that Basically, what brought us together was the production and the use of renewable raw materials. So, I mean, what I've been hearing here is uh, music to my ears because I can see that there are many developments at various stages, both at the Commission, but also in the regions and in the national um, bioeconomy strategies for the member states that have some. Um, but I also want to say that the Alliance is really dedicated to resource efficiency, sustainability, and also mainstreaming the bioeconomy. So we founded uh, the Alliance in 2015, that's uh, two commission mandates ago, and uh, we have now grown into a healthy critical mass of uh, 15 EU trade associations representing the full value chain. So for uh, Simona's uh, <laughs> concerns, it's really from primary primary producers, so farmers and foresters, all the way through processing and the production of bio-based products and ingredients for everyday purposes. So we'd like to set the scene. Um, how we see it? Well, we've, uh, we've been uh, working on EU policies for many years now. We have also realized that they are scattered around the different uh, Director Generals of the Commission. So just as you do, we call for a consistent uh, coordination and a long-term stable framework that would encompass all the EU priorities. So in this framework, it's not in ministries, but here we call for a bioeconomy commissioner, or at the very least a bioeconomy coordinator across all the EU policies. And with the launch of our manifesto today, we really want to, uh, to put the bioeconomy firmly back on the map of the future Commission's policy priorities. So we have, um, I, I'll just touch upon three main things to, to get the conversation going. But uh, first and foremost, this coordination across all ministries, policies, commissioners at all levels. Uh, secondly, yes, research and innovation we've touched upon, but indeed it needs to go to commercialization, and we see this is happening thanks to the public-private partnership Circular Bio-Based Europe. Uh, but we want more of that and probably better balanced across the different member states. And um, for finally, the, the third thing that is really important for us is, uh, of course, we, we build on research and innovation actions. We, we want to scale up um, biorefineries here in the member states. But we also need to go beyond research and innovation to market creation measures. We need to be, at the very least, at a level playing field. I'm not talking about competitive advantage, but with a level playing field with the fossil-based uh, products. And we, for this, we have worked together with stakeholders and DG Grow on the lead market initiative that was published. And that was basically listing a number of market creation measures across standardization, across green public procurement, um, which was called taking bio-based, um, it was not from niche to norm, but from niche to market. And this would be very much our focus for uh, the next commission. 
Thanks very much, Juliet. So you mentioned the Bioeconomy Manifesto, which I picked up uh, out here on the table. And so, Peter, I wanted to put one uh, point to you that uh, the, the manifesto makes, which Juliet was just making as well, which is that they want to see more coordination um, with these policies. What do you think of this idea of having a bioeconomy commissioner? Uh, I know it's not up to you, but if it was, <laughs> what would you think of that idea? And also, the how can we improve, as the manifesto calls for, how can we improve coordination because this area is, in many ways, by its nature, cross-sectoral. Um, Dave, uh, um, indeed, uh, um, you have said it yourself. It's not up to me to decide on uh, uh, the portfolio of future commissioners. Uh, um, but um, I like the, the idea. Um, but uh, even more important, I think um, I like the manifesto. Um, I think that's uh, um, a very, very good uh, um, way of um, um, yeah, showcasing um, the potential of this uh, um, policy area. Um, and we agree with, with many of the, the, the things you are outlining. Um, um, Dave, you have also indicated in the beginning uh, the definition um, of, of the bioeconomy. Um, and uh, um, that has um, the beauty that it is a very wide concept. It's cross-sectoral, it's intersectoral. Um, it's uh, um, therefore also allows to um, 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 look into trade-offs uh, between uh, um, um, different uh, perspectives, uh, but it's uh, um, also associated with challenges. Uh, um, and uh, um, some of the challenges are also associated with uh, um, how do we um, yeah, communicate uh, um, the benefits, the potential uh, to the consumers, to the citizens, uh, convince them that uh, uh, these bio-based materials um, really have benefits, uh, um, that they have often um, lower life cycle um, assessment, uh, a bio-based um, recycled uh, a bottle um, that is not made out of uh, um, plastic-based, uh, um, of not out made of fossil-based uh, plastic or uh, pottery uh, um, from uh, circular recycled um, materials. Um, or, or a T-shirt uh, from cellulosis, uh, probably comes from Sweden. Uh, um, these are innovative products, yeah, which we need to uh, communicate on, and for which we need to also uh, uh, pave, pave the ground. And this needs um, um, an all-government um, um, approach. Um, and uh, um, United States has been mentioned. Uh, United States, uh, um, they have uh, also adopted uh, last year um, um, an executive order, um, President Biden has signed a, an executive order um, on biotechnology, biomanufacturing, and the bioeconomy. Um, and we have spoken with our colleagues in the US. Uh, they are also working on an all-of-government approach. Um, and I think uh, um, that means that uh, um, the different uh, um, departments work together, and this is exactly what we are doing uh, in, inside the commission. Uh, uh, we work together with our colleagues from DG Agriculture, with DG, DG Environment, with uh, um, the Joint Research Center, DG Sante, um, uh, DG uh, Klima, uh, DG Research Innovation. So I think uh, we, we do have a very uh, close uh, coordination between the services on these dossiers because it's clear to build a coherent framework, uh, you also uh, need to work together. And uh, this is why we also do have an EU bioeconomy strategy and uh, um, I think we can do more and better, um, and this is why we are also working towards an update of the bioeconomy strategy. Um, even without a bioeconomy commissioner, would it, would it be helpful just to have a, a person in charge of that cross-sectoral activity, so a coordinator that goes in between all the different DGs and is kind of the person in charge of that coordination? Yes, um, um, but uh, um, as I said, I mean, within... Uh, um, the commission also, um, the, um, um, there, there is a, um, um, a very clear, coherent uh, um, coordination mechanism which brings all the services together. Um, Christina, how has Sweden approached the cross-sectoral nature of this? Um, do you have a, you know, does the buck stop with somebody with the bioeconomy? How has Sweden approached it, especially considering how important the bioeconomy is to Sweden? 
Yeah, so I, I, I think, no, we don't have uh, that formalized uh, system, I think, in Sweden. It, it, it's more of a, a sort of dynamic system, I would say. Um, but I, I think it's, it's a, a very interesting question, both for sort of how we deal with bioeconomy on the national level, but also at the EU level. Because, of course, uh, the, in the best case scenario, you would... Uh, sort of take bioeconomy into consideration no matter what sort of policy you're, you're forming or shaping. And how do you do this? As the, as, uh, what is the best way to do this? Is it to have a, a specific commissioner or a specific person? Or is it more to make sure that you really uh, mainstream bioeconomy into to everything? And I think during our presidency uh, last, uh, well, in the spring this year, <laughs> Uh, we had a particular focus on bioeconomy and we adopted bioeconomy council conclusions. Um, and I think that was really useful because there we had a lot of this discussion about how to make sure that you, you have this holistic and horizontal approach to bioeconomy and to make sure that you have a functioning sort of um, legislative environment to make sure that you can develop bioeconomy. And here I'm thinking that because now what we're talking about at the moment in 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 our me, me and Simona in in our everyday work now in the in the council is the rural areas and there we're talking a lot about rural proofing and the commission is talking about uh, rural pr proofing quite a lot to make sure that new policies no matter in which field does not sort of affect rural areas negatively and I think this is a sort of concept that we should take with us also for bioeconomy that no matter how we how we sort of are structured we should always have at the back of our heads the, the concept of bioeconomy and, and, and to make sure that new policies um, in whatever area will not sort of hamper the, the development of the bioeconomy. So I think that this is something uh, that we need to, to keep an eye on moving forward. Well, Simona, when, when you and, and uh, Christina and all of your, your uh, uh, colleagues in the council are working together on this issue, um, how, how predictable has the policy space in this area been? Um, and because it's so cross-sectoral and we know things can have an influence on other areas, uh, Christina talked about this idea of rural proofing, which is a big buzzword in the council now. Um, how can we make sure that the policy is both predictable and also taking into account all the knock-on effects they can have? Well, um, in an optimal scenario, a bioeconomy policy would serve, or would try to balance um, all three pillars of sustainability. So the economic, the environmental, and also the social one. Um, but and and if 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 we want to tick all these boxes, so we also have to have um, the legislation um, which affects the bioeconomy directly or indirectly um, balanced in this uh, in this way. And we have had a lot of discussion in the council um, for agriculture and um, uh, fisheries. We have had a lot of discussions, and you may be aware also of um, legislative proposals being dealt with, uh, where there was a lot of, uh, um, not criticism, but um, um, yeah, um, questions whether the proposals also, which came at the EU level, whether they, they have ticked all these boxes, whether all the consequences, consequences have, uh, were, have, have been properly assessed. But clearly, we have a common goal. This is the green transition. We want to become uh, climate neutral. So also, these aspects have to have to be valid um, in in the same way. And um, when we are talking about a bioeconomy, for example, in Slovenia, there was one concern related to if we further uh, stimulate uh, biomass use from agriculture whether this would have an implication on the production of food. So, so these this questions have to be addressed uh, 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 accordingly. And maybe this is also um, uh, important that kind of member states or at the regional level, um, such concerns can be appro uh, appropriately addressed uh, uh, within the national decisions taken on bioeconomy. And for that reason, for example, in Slovenia, the most... Um, 
the most promising biomass uh, is seen as the woody biomass. And if we talk about agriculture, it's uh, the excrement of, uh, of livestock on one side, but also residues from agriculture, but uh, not, uh, not directly um, food or feed, which is pro uh, produced for, uh, for those um, purposes. So, so how, how really to, and it's a difficult question, how you really have this uh, proper balance. And it will be even more difficult in future because if the demand for bio-based products, which, which would help uh, the, the Europe to become climate neutral, um, if this would have an implication, what, what would be the implication on the land, which is limited, and uh, what, will be what we will produce on this land in future. So it's, it's quite challenging what comes. Well, Barna, as Simona mentions, the consequences can be cross-sectoral, but the benefits can also be cross-sectoral, right? So there can be goals in all kinds of different areas, climate change mitigation, energy security, innovation, strategic autonomy, and also agricultural goals, right? So how do we, how can the EU bioeconomy help meet those multiple goals? Uh, and how can policymakers and the public understand it as a kind of cross-sectoral benefit? It's, uh, yeah, it's a complex question, what you put. What I am saying, um, and uh, I think I have to continue where it was um, said clearly, uh, from the EU level to tackle all these different sectorial approaches, the societal aspect, we need a more clear uh, speak out of the bioeconomy. We need a policy, so it's, uh, we need, uh, at the European level, a uh, more robust uh, uh, bioeconomy agenda. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because, uh, as referring back to my previous words, the countries, especially the small ones, they are tired by the different issues. They are focusing today for the most important and the most, um, um, uh, the, the must to do things. And I suppose, for the future, to be able to tackle this interconnection, the complexity of sustainability that the energy sector requiring biomass, the food sector requiring biomass, the different uh, industrial sectors do require biomass. I must say, also in Eastern Europe, these are tackled. But I'm not saying that it's tackled in a uh, not necessarily sustainable way because they are not interlinked. They are not discussing to each other the different sectors. The, size, the society is not informed or just informed from the perspective of the different sectors. They are always explaining why it's important for them to use biomass. So in this context, I think the future uh, commission has a role in putting on the agenda the bioeconomy uh, to, 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 to make the member states to tackle this question in its complexity. Uh, it's important to bring this also for those countries where there is no bioeconomy strategy. Uh, I'm not saying that we need, each country needs bioeconomy strategy, but to have it on the agenda, to have it at the political level discussion, the bioeconomy as such, that would help each country to start to think in a systemic way, in more uh, complex way. So in, in this context, it's uh, important to, to have a robust, uh, more robust uh, agenda. Um, I will stop here. I, I have some reflections also. No, uh, maybe also I would add uh, a little bit on the, on the Eastern European uh, biomass, uh, existing biomass. We have a bioeconomy sector today. Uh, we produce a lot of biomass, but basically this is exported as a raw material. It's not processed. It was mentioned by. We do not have the processing capacities. So um, that's where we have to focus. And a little bit I'm bringing here the discussion um, which is uh, today, uh, uh, again, a buzzword, or so, so to say, the strategic autonomy of Europe. If we are thinking clearly on and, and more in the strategic autonomy of Europe, producing biomass and the produced biomass in Eastern Europe should play a big role also in the future. What do we do with that biomass? We just export it or we are processing locally? And that's where I would say, and I would connect with what I was saying uh, before with the research and innovation, but that research and innovation, that knowledge which was already produced in the western part or Nordic part of Europe should be brought in Eastern Europe because we need the knowledge transfer and to use that knowledge to be able to, um, to process the biomass there locally, at local level. 
So in that context, we really need uh, to figure out uh, how uh, we will um, uh, bring that knowledge in east and we pr process the biomass. And in this context, I'm coming back and now I'm finishing. The next commission will have a big role to rethink the role of Eastern Europe in all this um, uh, setup. Because Eastern Europe, if not to uh, discuss and not to mention Western Balkan and the Eastern Partnership uh, countries, Ukraine, Moldova, they are all biomass producers. So the role of Eastern Europe in the big picture of the bioeconomy of European strategic autonomy on biomass use, it has to be retalked and the Commission has a big role in this. And I see this for the future as a, as a big point for uh, cross-sectorial uh, approaches. Thank you. Well, you say it, it may not be necessary for every country to have a bioeconomy strategy, but we do have a bioeconomy strategy at EU level. Juliet, uh, you know, that, that strategy has now been updated. What would you say have been the successes so far of that updated bioeconomy strategy, and how would you say it could be improved? Yes, thank you, Dave, for this uh, pointed question. And uh, I would say one of the main successes of the uh, bioeconomy strategy was the um, the extension of the public-private partnership, the circular bio-based Europe, and that probably fits into your concerns because uh, you have mentioned the uh, lack of processing capabilities in Eastern Europe, but as European Bioeconomy Alliance, we represent more than 5,000 companies. Uh, all these are small to large uh, biorefineries, so the bioeconomy does exist in, in, in many member states. Uh, we do produce uh, all ingredients for all the outlets of the bioeconomy, so that's from, I would say, cereals, but also many other, um, other uh, room, renewable raw materials. But my point here is to say the bioeconomy exists today. It's based on the biorefinery model that takes in some renewable raw materials and that feeds all outlets of the bioeconomy, so from food, feed, but also industrial application, very innovative or traditional applications, and energy. So this is to set the scheme between um, the, the various uh, things that have been done. I would say for this, it's, it's quite uh, interesting to see the future. And uh, for us, what would be absolutely key is First is consistency, but I think we should also go across, DG, uh, Peter mentioned all the different DGs. I think DG FISMA is also key because DG FISMA is leading on the action plan for sustainable finance. And we see there that there are discrepancies between the various delegated acts, the, the various technical screening criteria, mm -hmm. which says one thing in the Climate Delegated Act and which forbids uh, the use of agricultural biomass in the Circular Economy Delegated Act. So for us, it should really be taken as an opportunity to, pr to promote the bioeconomy benefits instead of um, having discrepancies that will definitely uh, probably deter investments. Uh, we talked about investments. Investments in biorefineries are significant investments. We need to de-risk them. We need to continue to build on research and innovation action. Uh, Peter mentioned also uh, raising awareness amongst consumers. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel there. We have already good existing funded by the European Commission examples. We have the German-led um, bio, <laughs> sorry, everything bio, which is an interesting um, initiative because basically it uh, gives as much information as you can get on the bio-based ingredients. So that's very similar to, you have mentioned the United States and the IRA, but they also have the USDA Bio Preferred Program where European ingredients are doing very well. So um, the question is, why can't we do this here? We have the framework for green public procurement. We need to uh, raise awareness amongst public procurers, but also the European consumers. Justice, from a research perspective, how helpful is the EU's updated bioeconomy strategy. Um, do strategies like this, whether they're on EU or national level, do they help kind of guide research in good directions? I think they can provide a very important uh, strategic tool uh, for decision makers to organize uh, their activities. 
I like the idea of having a new commissioner on the bioeconomy as from a research perspective, we see the uh, agriculture and food sector as being part of the bioeconomy, but this is, is more than just converting biological resources in, in uh, food and feed, fuel and uh, other parts. Uh, we have to consider that it can also play a very important role uh, for the chemical industry, etc. And we have seen in our research, for example, that in regions where we have biorefineries, the uh, income level, relatively speaking, per capita was a little bit higher than in other regions. And so having a bioeconomy strategy, and in particular, we see this effect in, in Eastern Europe, can help also to uh, contribute to rural development as many of these biorefineries are in rural areas and it can provide uh, an additional opportunity uh, for income support. So it goes beyond just uh, investing in these technologies as further rural development, social implications. And again, having a strategy will be very helpful and having a commissioner even more. Peter, what would you say are the successes of the updated bioeconomy strategy so far? Many have already been mentioned. Uh, um, um, we have BioEast, uh, um, a dedicated uh, um, um, approach to also uh, support uh, the countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, um, we, we also have um, developed a uh, um, stakeholder fora. We have brought the member states together in the European Bioeconomy uh, Policy Forum. Um, we have this uh, circular bio-based Europe uh, a partnership. Uh, that's a, a partnership uh, between um, uh, the bio-based industries consortium um, and the European uh, uh, Commission of Public-Private Partnership, um, which um, 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 other regions of the world are looking at uh, um, in an envious way because we have already developed also um, the language uh, um, to, to uh, have a cooperation between industry and the public administration. I think uh, that is important. Let me also mention next week there will be um, the Circular Bio-Based Europe um, Stakeholder uh, Forum here in Brussels. Uh, uh, this is uh, certainly a, a very uh, successful um, 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 element uh, which we have already uh, set up. Uh, um, um, we have also provided support uh, to, to member states uh, um, and regions um, to develop uh, their uh, strategies. Uh, and uh, we have seen that uh, um, more and more member states uh, um, today, uh, 10 member states have dedicated uh, uh, strategies, 28 regions have dedicated uh, strategies. So all of this is uh, um, um, I'm going into the right uh, direction, but yet we need to do more, um, but uh, we also, all actors need to use the available instruments also to uh, their full potential. Um, we have, for instance, in the Common Agriculture Policy also a specific objective related uh, to the bioeconomy that allows member states uh, to use the entire uh, instruments uh, uh, that the Common Agriculture uh, Policy makes available for um, yeah, developing innovative ideas related to the bioeconomy. Um, my, my vision would be that uh, we, we try to do what we have done in the um, bioenergy sector, renewable energies. We have brought them um, to the um, producers, to the farm sector, yeah, to the foresters. Uh, but that we can do that also with uh, um, other innovative products. I have shown some of them, that we are really trying to build up these value chains, which make us less dependent from imports. For instance, in the feed sector, just to give one example, um, there are um, interesting um, uh, projects that are funded through research and innovation, um, how to um, produce um, feed utilizing bio waste, food waste um, with insects. Yeah? Uh, these are, uh, there we have demonstration um, and, and pilot uh, projects but they could be scaled up. They could help us to reduce, for instance, uh, the amounts of uh, soybeans we have to import from, from other uh, um, parts of the uh, planet, which is associated with a lot of um, uh, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, thereby, we could increase also our um, yeah, um, strategic autonomy. So there are really benefits in building up new um, 
value-added uh, chains, but uh, uh, we also have to utilize the entire um, um, array of instruments that is already available. Well, you mentioned other parts of the world and that other parts of the world might be looking enviously at the bioeconomy strategy. Let's talk about the IRA. It's been brought up a couple of times. That is an area that we keep hearing European businesses are looking toward the U.S. enviously. Um, Barna, um, when we're comparing the EU's policy on the bioeconomy to other parts of the world, how do you think it fares? And in particular, now with the IRA, we know that the IRA offers tax incentives and rebates to businesses investing in projects that bioeconomy projects would uh, qualify for. Um, do you think that that type of financial funding is, can it be matched here in Europe? Uh, how, how is Europe doing in that sense? Uh, yes, now I will uh, step out a little bit from the Eastern European perspective. Of course, that's also part of it, but um, I would be more on the European scale. On one hand, the USA. On the other hand, we see China. It's investing a lot. We see Brazil. It's investing a lot. We see Indonesia. It's investing. We see that the big countries started to invest in biotechnology, biomanufacturing. So by this, we see that it's not just research and innovation driven. So it's not just by the excellence driven um, by economy it's put on the stage, but they started to invest in the market uh, access, how they can help the, uh, the companies who are in the bioeconomy to put their products on the market, to be on the market. And I think here is coming our role and we have to, I'm not saying to catch up, but to switch a little bit our thinking in Europe, that we need to invest in the biomanufacturing and biotechnologies to reach to the market. And, um, and we were the front runners on research and innovation. We are still the front runners on research and innovation. We have the EU research fr framework program, as it was mentioned, the CBUGU, which is the Central uh, uh, Circular Biobased Europe joint undertaking, it was mentioned here. But still, we are just keeping on the excellent side. So the best research we are financing, but how this reach to the market, it's not yet there. So where, where we need to invest, uh, is a little bit to look this angle, how we can put on the stage the, the already uh, put forward research and innovation achievements. And I, here I, it's coming again the question of Eastern Europe. There was a lot of knowledge in the past 10 years done in Europe, but we, what we see that some of them started to leave Europe. And it's invested in the US because they have incentives even sometimes in China or other parts of the world. So what we need to see here a little bit more, how we can put in practice in Europe, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, to bring it closer to the, to the local level. And uh, here I, I see the, the key point for the future for us, that uh, we are uh, putting emphasis on that part of, uh, of, um, of the international bioeconomy. So we see the partners and of course, then we have to think of taxes. We have to think of um, already some countries are, are, are using those, reinvest that money, and, and then by this um, uh, we can uh, achieve and keep it our research and innovation, which we already created in Europe. Not to mention that we also need to um, invest most probably in uh, informing the population, the society. Which, uh, which we are, where we are lagging behind a little bit uh, also, and, uh, and especially in those countries where they are more traditional, traditional thinking, we need to explain and invest to explain to them why we would like to have more biotechnology, more biomass manufacturing in the country, what we would bring in a, a longer term, what are the consequences, and where we would bring us uh, more in the competitiveness. I, I stop here. I think that's where I see that the uh, role of uh, Europe in, in this international context. Thank you. Juliet, uh, how do you think the prospects for the bioeconomy in Europe compare to other parts of the world, particularly considering how much funding is being poured in in China and the United States? Well, I think uh, for me, prospects are good. So if you look at the, at the history of the bioeconomy, basically, we're, um, we are front runners. I think the EU has impressive capacity in primary production. I'm talking agriculture and forestry. The EU also has a huge capacity in industrial assets. 
So um, <coughs> what we are missing basically is the, um, what you mentioned. Uh, on top of being a scientific powerhouse, I think the EU really needs to uh, match its ambitions in the Horizon Europe 10th program, but also with appropriate funding in the common agricultural policy. That is actually key for um, producing the agricultural biomass. There are other regulations uh, in forestry. So I think appropriate funding for all the primary producers will be absolutely key. So Horizon Europe, I mentioned, yes, it's a, we have a scientific excellence. We are still the front runners. If I see, when I speak to my US counterparts, they take a lot of inspiration from us. So this needs to be said and um, um, we're not only the front runners, but we are the pioneers. I mean, we've been using bio-based ingredients for thousands of years in Europe. So um, a number of policies, Peter mentioned uh, the proteins and alleviate the imports, for instance. Well, this is again a typical example where um, the strategic policies could be combined between plant protein and the bioeconomy as we see it. Plant proteins and all the other outlets are part of the overarching bioeconomy. We see other countries, for instance, with deep pockets who are investing in standardization. So that's another, um, uh, another field where basically the commission could have a seat at the table because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So good prospects, but let's remain vigilant and, and let's not replicate what others do, but also take inspiration and, and think that what can be done somewhere else could also be done in the EU despite its diversity. Okay, let's take some questions that have come in from the audience. Again, you can send in your questions using that uh, hashtag and enter them in on Slido. They'll come up to me here on the tablet and I'll ask them to the panelists. First question is for Peter. The question is from Anna Holmberg. Uh, it's a clarification question, I think. Concerning the bioeconomy strategy, did you state that we can expect an update during this mandate? Or what does the timeline look like for the, for, for the commission? on this? Um, no, I did not say uh, um, that uh, the update will come um, under this uh, mandate. Um, I would have to look up the exact uh, uh, wording um, uh, the Council um, has chosen, but uh, um, uh, um, I think uh, it was made reference uh, that um, until the end of this multi-annual financial framework, um, hence until the end of 27-28, uh, uh, um, we will um, um, have an update. Uh, um, without having a specific uh, a year or date, but uh, certainly uh, this will be uh, one of the things we will work towards. Um, we will also have uh, uh, next year in, in March, on the 13th and 14th of March, uh, another uh, bioeconomy um, festival actually here in, in Brussels with the main event in Brussels with more than 30 satellite events uh, all around uh, uh, the EU organized by you, by the stakeholders. Uh, we will also then have another bioeconomy manifesto from our um, bioeconomy youth ambassadors. Uh, um, so um, I think uh, um, we, we see that there is a momentum um, around uh, the bioeconomy and uh, there's a lot of energy and uh, uh, positive uh, expectations. So still lots to come during this term. Mark your calendars for that festival in March. Uh, you heard it here, maybe not first, but... Please. Definitively. Uh, okay, Christina, the next question is for you. Uh, this question is from Jody Quirk from Client Earth. Uh, if you recognize that the sustainable use of biomass is one of the critical issues for the development of the bioeconomy, then how do you intend to address the biomass availability gap, taking into account trade offs and ecological limits? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think that was quite a big and sort of existential question, perhaps. But I, I think, if I may, I, I might sort of perhaps limit it to how the way we use forest biomass in Sweden. Uh, and there, uh, we actually, because of course, as we can see in, in some countries, I mean, across the globe, uh, if you use forest biomass in a, in a sort of uncontrolled way, like we did back in 
in the olden days, then of course the forests tend to, to disappear. And that is also what has happened in, in many parts of, of the world where there used to be forests, but there are not anymore. Um, in Sweden, uh, we had a similar situation, uh, but of course we had more uh, forest. But then, uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, we, we started sort of putting limitations on how you use forest and, and step by step introducing requirements to replant when you harvest in the forest. Uh, and then uh, I think we have a forestry sort of modern legislation stemming from over 100 years ago where these requirements become, became uh, more and more clear. And I think that is what has been a sort of um, a very important step for us because, of course, we have increased our forest uh, cover uh, quite uh, substantially um, during the, the last century. And I think this is something you, you have to have this in, in, in sort of, uh, you really have to put focus in this when you develop the bioeconomy. Because, of course, if we use biomass unsustainably, then we will not have anything left. Uh, to, to, to develop our, our bioeconomy with. So I think this is a, a, a really a key, key issue. And I think this is something that we really have to sort of take into account, especially moving forward when there will, the, the, the demand will increase and there will be different sort of pressures on the, on the resources that we have. And I know that this is something the commission is looking into. This is something that that was mentioned by the member states in our council conclusions. Um, so, so this is absolutely a sort of core question to, to keep in mind when we are moving forward. Well, we have a related question in the same vein for justice online. So this question comes from Oscar Mindegard, uh, APA with the Greens. Uh, so the question for justice is, do we have a sufficient understanding of how much biomass is actually available without depleting the ecosystems that the residues come from? We want to use the biomass for everything, but it already serves a function in the ecosystems. Very good and important uh, question. Um, at this point in time, we have good information about the availability and renewal of biomass. We have less information about how much we basically need for uh, maintaining crucial ecosystem services and how much we can extract without having negative implication on these services. In this regard, we need more uh, research. Okay, next question is for Barna. This question is from Giovanni Colombo. The question is, do you believe that algae cultivation could be the answer to, bio, to the biomass challenge? If yes, in your opinion, is the EU doing enough to capture this opportunity? Yes, uh, yeah, that's a very specific question. Um, since I am not an expert on algae industry, however, what I can say that clearly it's a way forward and what I can see and I can add from my perspective from the past two years where I am working a little bit more and it's neglected, we are talking about RG sector mostly linked with uh, seas and ocean. And we are not talking at all about the freshwater part. And this is a link, the bioeconomy linked with the freshwater. So the freshwater based bioeconomy, it's not tackled in Europe. It's not tackled at research level, at innovation level, and it's not properly. We are always just talking about fish and the fish-related biomass, but not on the sector which could thrive. And this one, one of these, it's the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the algae sector, which can be also uh, done in the land um, uh, with, the, with the fresh water. So I clearly see that the algae can play a big role in the future. Yeah, the algae sector. Peter, how does the Commission view the prospects of algae? Uh, very positively. Uh, we do have an algae uh, strategy. We have uh, um, outlined uh, um, also in, in the bioeconomy strategy that uh, the bioeconomy is not only um, agriculture and forestry, it's also the blue bioeconomy and uh, um, that is related uh, to algae uh, um, and utilizing um, their uh, potential um, to produce feed, food, fiber uh, inputs for uh, the chemical 
uh, uh, industry. Um, I think uh, uh, that's also another area where research and innovation uh, uh, still can, can uh, um, do a lot and uh, develop uh, new um, possibilities uh, for the future. Okay, so the next question is kind of an interesting existential one uh, for Juliet. So it's, it's kind of a question of what, what do we mean when we say bioeconomy? Uh, so it's from Roberto Talenti. So the word bioeconomy seems to involve a new type of economic model, but is this so? Is bioeconomy entailing a new way of conceiving the economic system, or is it just a new economic sector which has shifted the original pressure on inorganic resources to the exploitation of organic ones? Well, thank you for this question, <laughs> Roberto. Um, I would say, for me, this is uh, perhaps a new word. And when we built the European Bioeconomy Alliance, we had questions about the terminology we would use, because I think it says different things to different people, and it says different things in terms of semantics to people with different native languages. Um, our first experiences when we went to the European Parliament was to say, oh, bio, so it's all organic, is it? Um, so voila, I think <laughs> the concept is as old as the Egyptians, uh, who used uh, bio-based ingredients in their facial creams or to strengthen their papyrus. But the, the concept is indeed uh, an overarching policy. Um, I won't uh, go into the shifting into inorganic into organic, but uh, I would say that it's a concept that has existed for thousands of years. We are putting it here in Europe under the uh, overarching bioeconomy strategy policy because this is what we have and we want to abide by um, the um, strategies and rules that we have in place. Um, but indeed, it's an existential question. Uh, I think uh, I would turn the question back to Roberto. How would you call it? Yeah. Well, he's not here to answer, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe I'll later. <laughs> um, okay, next question is for Peter. This question is from Oliver K. Uh, the commission is looking at the issue of an availability gap. What are the policy consequences, especially with regards to cascading of end use? Overall, I think we have um, um, a lot of opportunities um, to um, enhance the cascading use of, of uh, um, materials in the entire economy. Yeah? But uh, this circular and cascading uh, principle can also be reinforced um, with respect um, to the way we um, utilize uh, uh, biomass uh, and it can be significantly enhanced. Uh, and I have given uh, one, one example, a um, um, significant amount um, of the food um, that is produced um, is um, being, being wasted, is uh, re, um, being put into uh, incinerations, uh, um, and it's not um, valorized. So through valorization, uh, um, I think we, we still have um, a lot of potential to create uh, more value added uh, um, and also do something good for the environment. So that principle, um, we still um, all together need to be innovative in um, yeah, deploying that principle um, uh, across the board uh, in bioeconomy. Okay, next question is for Justice online. The question is from but Diana Powers. Have the different efficiencies of the various biomass pathways, such as anaerobic digestion, pyrogasification, et cetera, been compared and mapped out? Yes. Uh, so this has been done. Uh, we have developed, or not only we, but in, in collaboration with other researchers, uh, biomass flow models that allow us to identify how much biomass is uh, processed within uh, different uh, um, sectors within our economy. And this then allows us uh, to do some comparisons. We have to be careful to draw specific conclusions from these kind uh, of uh, analysis. At this point in time, 
for properly assessing how we would love to do this uh, efficiency, uh, more information uh, would be needed to draw more strong uh, conclusions about relative uh, comparative advantages uh, with respect to different uh, processing uh, streams. So that would be something uh, that requires still uh, further research. But let me just add something on the different sectors of the uh, bioeconomy. What is not so important whether we talk about algae, whether we talk about hemp, whether we talk about insects, etc., We need to have an enabling uh, environment so that the private sector can choose where they want to go. It's very difficult for policymakers to say this will be the field or that will be the field. There are so many issues that play a role, but policymakers should work on the enabling environment. Just a quick follow-up question for you, Justice, uh, from Nestor Domushiev. I hope I'm understanding this question correctly. Uh, do you know some other? Uh, do you know a source other than JRC, other than the Joint Research Center, for bioeconomy data at EU level? Um, okay, that is. Um Basically, uh, the JRC is putting together the information that is coming from uh, the member states, right? So you can look also at member state level uh, uh, data. There you may find some more detailed data uh, with respect to the bioeconomy, depending on the question uh, you want to ask. If you are interested in specific bioeconomy subsectors like the forestry sector, uh, European Forestry Institute, EFI, for example, they provide more detailed data. Uh, if you are interested in, in the agriculture data, uh, you can uh, uh, look at uh, the national uh, accounting statistics. If you are interested in uh, marine data, uh, they are uh, the Marine Resource Institute of the European Union provides detailed data. For environmental data, you can go to the European Environmental Institute in Copenhagen and find more uh, detailed data. So JRC and Eurostat, they compromise, they put this data together and aggregate them. Okay, great. So Peter, I have two questions for you. Uh, the, the first one is from Francesca Riccardi from Sustainable Public Affairs. The Commission has announced that it will come up with a dedicated initiative on biotech and biomanufacturing. How can we expect this initiative to support the development of the bioeconomy in the EU? Second question is from Frederic Gallo. What do you think of the so-called sustainable aviation fuel, SAF? Is it a good idea to use plastic waste to make SAF from the prevention and reuse priorities of waste? Maybe degrowth in the aviation sector will be the most viable solution environmentally. Good and challenging questions. Uh, um, on, on, on the first one, um, the uh, uh, biotech and biomanufacturing uh, initiative uh, has been uh, put into the work uh, program of the, of the commission. Uh, um, this uh, um, should come uh, forward uh, uh, next year. Um, and uh, um, clearly, I would see um, a very important uh, link uh, to the to the bioeconomy because uh, in the bioeconomy we have innovative uh, industries. Uh, we have uh, talked about some some examples. Uh, for instance, uh, the Circular Biobased Europe uh, uh, partnership. There are uh, consortia which are heavily relying also on on uh, biotechnologies, uh, and uh, um, um, there are also. Um, there's a wide array of different uh, um, use cases of biotechnologies. It's not only in the health sector, it's not only uh, industrial biotechnology, but it's, uh, or, or in the food sector, but it's also, for instance, uh, um, environmental remediation, uh, uh, which uh, um, uses, which can use uh, biotechnology increasingly. So I think uh, that whole spectrum will be um, looked at and uh, um, um, but uh, in a, um, looking at both uh, um, sites, uh, on the one hand, uh, um, uh, safeguarding the, the innovation principle, but also uh, the precautionary uh, principle uh, um, has to be uh, looked at. So um, um, hopefully everybody uh, will continue to be curious um, of uh, what the Commission will come up with uh, then next year. Um, on sustainable aviation fuels, uh, um, this certainly is, is uh, one uh, um, area uh, where, indeed, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, 
we cannot um, continue to have uh, uh, unlimited uh, uh, growth. Uh, so, but but this is uh, uh, very much also um, um, a personal um, decision of of everybody. Yeah. Um, then, on the other hand, we will see that uh, uh, many of us uh, will continue um, um, to use uh, um, flights, and uh, we uh, um, have to look there for better solutions than what we have today. Um, and that's not uh, uh, simple. Again, this is a, a big ticket uh, task for research and innovation. We are working on it. Uh, we are working on sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, there have been new uh, um, types of uh, more sustainable aviation f uh, fuels uh, that have been uh, developed, uh, but uh, I think uh, we have not uh, reached the end of that uh, um, development process yet, and more can be done. Uh, it certainly will f uh, continue to feature also prominently within Horizon Europe as one, one of our priorities. Well, we have just a few minutes left, but I want to ask each of you very quickly, give me a 30-second answer each. Um, what do you think is the most promising area of the bioeconomy right now in one day before December 2023? Uh, Peter, we'll start with you. Um, developing and bringing forward uh, um, innovative um, solutions um, in the way how we deal with uh, um, the, the biosphere and creating thereby really uh, opportunities uh, for all dimensions of uh, sustainability. Christina? Yeah, I think given the global situation and the energy crisis and, and sort of energy um, um, situation moving forward, I, I think I would like to mention the bioenergy, carbon capture and storage BECs, which Sweden, among others, are working uh, a lot on which can sort of um, lead to, to negative emissions, actually. Um, so I think this is uh, very interesting moving forward. But there are many things I have yes, to say. Yes, it's only the most interesting thing among <laughs> yeah. many interesting things. Simona? Um, po, difficult to, to, to answer from, from, a pers as mentioned from, from a perspective of Slovenia. We, set, we, we, we see the champion in the forests because uh, we have a long-standing uh, sustainable uh, management of forests uh, and we, we see that if we can do it in a way um, to uh, maintain this quality of forests, we can even have the necessary biomass. But in general, I think the, the, the biggest uh, potential will have uh, products, bio-based products, which will um, uh, be produced instead of fossil, uh, fossil fuels, uh, fossil fuel products. Uh, there the demand will rise, I think, mostly. And, but this is also included a, a, threat, a threat for the, for the whole system. Mm. That's what we have to bear in mind. Barna? I think I will be um, uh, disruptive uh, or, or how to assert it. I will turn the question because the question oh. saying, asking whether it's which is the most uh, prominent now, that was a question of 10 years ago or 12 years ago. I'm not to question, of course it's always a question and it's, it has to be answered. Uh, today the answer is more that what we already put in place as I am now, I am repeating our, myself, with research and innovation, we have to bring into the market. So all the promising which we already developed with research and innovation in the past 10 years, it's time now to bring it on the market because we have a lot. We have a lot of promising issues. We have um, pilot and demo projects. We have to bring in the market, not just put in one place in Europe, but we have to bring it in other places of Europe and repli replicate them. So that's here the big key question for the next commission, I think. And that's where we have to work a little bit more on, not just the excellence, which we use usually in the past years, we always put the excellence, which is the most promising. No, we have a lot of promising. Now it's time to bring it on the market. Justice, I'll go to you next. Right. I think for me, also following up what Bana has said, is that um, we may have to make it easier for the private sector to invest in applying uh, new solutions for the bioeconomy. So reducing the regulatory hurdles that the private sector is facing in the European Union. That will, from my perspective, is the most important thing to be achieved. And finally, Juliet. Yes, and from an all-encompassing perspective of an alliance representing 15 uh, sectors, I think 
I can only compliment Simona and uh, back up uh, Eustace and Barna. I think we need to create the incentives uh, for bio-based products to go to the market and uh, also promote their visibility and their benefits to the European consumers. Great. Well, I want to thank all the panelists for some really interesting interventions. I think we've heard today we have a lot to look forward to in the bioeconomy. Uh, we have this festival to look forward to in March uh, and the number of other things you mentioned coming up in the next month. So there's a lot coming up in terms of policy. There's a lot coming up in terms of innovation. Uh, and there's a lot coming up in terms of economic opportunity. So an interesting time for the bioeconomy. How about a round of applause for our great panelists? And thank you all for spending your early afternoon with us. If you're here in the room, I'd like to invite you now for a light lunch just outside these doors. If you're watching us at home or in your office, I wish you a great lunch wherever you are. Take care.